Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to talk about warfarin. It's an amazing anticoagulant. It's used for a lot of different reasons. We'll talk about those reasons. We're going to focus on the mechanism of action, right? So we'll go into that a little bit in detail on how it works inside of the liver cells. We'll talk about what we use it for. We'll talk about some of the things that you want to watch out for, certain side effects, adverse drug reactions. And then we'll talk about in what kind of populations or individuals would you not want to give this to. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and get started here on the mechanism of action of warfarin, right? So it's actually a really cool, like, little action of this guy. I like the way it works. It's pretty darn cool. So if you guys remember the liver, the liver has hepatocytes. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in into a nice little cute little hepatocyte. So this is going to be hepatocyte, just to give you guys some orientation here. And again, that's a liver cell. So what happens is when you take warfarin, warfarin is actually taken per oral, right? So PO. You ingest it, goes through your digestive tract, right? So it goes through your stomach, it goes into the duodenum, part of the small intestine, right? Gets uh, uh, absorbed across the actual gut, gets taken through the actual portal circulation into the liver, and through that, it's dropped off at the hepatocyte, right? Now, once warfarin is brought into the hepatocyte, it actually does get metabolized, right? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We'll talk about the cytochrome P450 oxidase enzyme, little Hey Arnold dude, all right? But let's talk about how it actually works. Now, if you guys wanna know a little bit here, there is a specific type of structure that is really important to making clotting proteins. That's what our liver does. Our liver makes a lot of clotting proteins. And there's really important clotting proteins that are involved in this process. So here's what happens. You have a specific molecule called vitamin K, right? Now vitamin K can exist in a couple different forms. In the first form we're gonna talk about, we're gonna say it's what's called a quinone. So we have vitamin K in the quinone state. And what I want you to remember about this is that it's pretty much in a oxidized state. What happens is vitamin K quinone is going to be, it actually reacts with a specific type of enzyme and we're gonna call that enzyme quinone reductase. So we'll call this enzyme quinone reductase and how does he actually reduce this vitamin K quinone? That's a great question guys. He uses a specific type of molecule here called NADPH. And what NADPH does is he drops off hydride ions onto the vitamin K quinone. And if you guys remember, hydride is basically whenever you have a proton and two electrons on the hydrogen atom, right? And that converts this into NADP positive. So you lose the actual hydride ions. Now from there, the vitamin K quinone is converted into a reduced form here. And that reduced form is called vitamin K hydroquinone. So now we're going to have vitamin K hydroquinone. Now, the next thing that happens is this vitamin K hydroquinone is going to react in another step. There's another really important enzyme right here. So here's gonna be this cute little enzyme. Let's do this enzyme in orange. Here's this guy. And this guy is called gamma glutamyl carboxylase. So we're gonna call this guy gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Okay, you see a little gamma sign, cute little guy, right? So gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Guess what happens here? Vitamin K hydroquinone is gonna react with this gamma glutamyl carboxylase. So what happens is this vitamin K hydroquinone actually drops off its electrons onto this gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Now, when it does that, it drops off of its electrons, right? So here we're gonna say drops off these electrons. Cute little electrons onto this gamma glutamyl carboxylase. It then gets converted into another oxidized form. So this is the reduced form, okay? So hydroquinone is the reduced form. Here, I'm gonna put here on the side here. This is the reduced form of the vitamin K. The vitamin K quinone and what's called vitamin K epoxide, these are mainly the uh, other forms of vitamin K, which is usually, this is the oxidized form, okay? What will happen is the vitamin K epoxide will get converted back into the vitamin K quinone through another specific enzyme. And this is the enzyme that I really want you guys to remember here. Let's do this one here in this maroonish color here. This enzyme is called 
vitamin K, epoxide reductase. So they call this enzyme here vitamin K epoxide reductase. Now, what this vitamin K epoxide reductase does is, is it helps to be able to stimulate this reaction going from vitamin K epoxide to vitamin K quinone. And it does that by donating electrons. So what happens is this vitamin K epoxide reductase will donate electrons to the vitamin K epoxide. There's a specific type of like uh, substrate group that's coming off of this guy. If you guys really wanna know it, it's coming off here and it's called a thiol group. And what happens is this helps to be able to donate electrons onto the vitamin K epoxide and convert it back into the vitamin K quinone. The gamma glutamate carboxylase enzyme is basically going to do what? It's gonna carboxylate these specific types of clotting proteins. Now, what is carboxylation? It's really a simple thing. All you're taking is adding on a CO2 molecule, right? So you're basically taking and you're adding on this group right here onto a specific molecule. And what that's going to do is it's going to help to be able to make this molecule more functional, okay? These proteins are not in their functional state, okay? So in other words, they're not really going to work unless we carboxylate them properly, okay? So in order for us to do that, we have to add this carboxyl group onto it to make them functional proteins. What are some of these clotting proteins that we need to do this to? Factor 2, factor 7, factor 9, factor 10, protein C, and protein S. These guys get carboxylated, and when they're carboxylated, they go and get converted into a nice functional form, okay? So now they're gonna be converted into a functional form. So you're gonna have this functional factor two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10, protein C, and protein S. And we'll just put here functional, okay? It doesn't mean that they're activated. They get activated when we talk about that in the coagulation cascade. All I want you guys to remember is without this gamma glutamate carboxylase, adding this carboxyl group onto these molecules, they wouldn't be properly functional. They wouldn't be able to do their job whenever they are activated, okay? So with that being said, this is the mechanism of how we synthesize and functionalize these actual clotting proteins, 2, 7, 9, 10, C, and S. Really quickly, Protein C and S, here's what I want you to remember about these guys. These ones are what we call anticoagulants. They're naturally anticoagulative, right? So they are naturally anticoagulants. Whereas these ones, factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10, these are more of your procoagulants. Okay, that's important. And we'll talk about why that's important whenever we get into some of the side effects of these. Okay, so this is what I want you to remember. These want to promote clot formation. These want to inhibit clot formation. And there is a specific reason why we should know that. And I'll talk about that afterwards. Now, you give the drug warfarin, right? Someone is basically taking the warfarin per orally. It gets absorbed across the GI tract, gets taken up into the liver. What does it do within this process? You see this guy right here that I told you was very, very important? That's what warfarin is gonna be working on. So now let's take this warfarin guy. Ooh, pretty. Take this warfarin and look at him. What is his function? He is going to work by inhibiting this enzyme. Let's follow the process here. If you inhibit the vitamin K epoxide reductase, what does that mean? That means that the vitamin K epoxide can't get converted into vitamin K quinone. If vitamin K quinone can't get uh, re uh, reduced into vitamin K hydroquinone, then it isn't able to drop off electrons onto the gamma glutamyl carboxylase. If gamma glutamyl carboxylase isn't able to add this carboxyl group onto proteins uh, 2, 7, 9, 10, C, and S, they're not going to be able to be functional. So you have not properly functional uh, procoagulants and anticoagulants. Now, let's focus mainly on the procoagulants in this state. What do these want to do? They want to promote clot formation. So, if you decrease the actual production of functional procoagulants, what do you lose? 
you lose that clot formation process. So now you're going to be inhibiting clot formation. That should make sense. Let's go a little bit deeper than that. Now, you take these proteins and you throw them out into the circulation, right? So we throw these proteins out into circulation. If you guys remember what their involvement is in the coagulation cascade, it's gonna make so much sense. If you guys remember, whenever the platelet plug is formed, it forms these negatively charged surfaces on the platelets, right? And what happens is, is that takes a specific protein called factor 12 and it activates him. So now you have this activated form of factor 12. Then what happens is factor 12 then takes and activates another factor called factor 11. Then this factor 11 goes and activates another one called factor 9. And then factor 9 will then combine with another one called factor 8. And what that'll do is that'll make this specific complex that can stimulate another molecule, which is called factor 10. Factor 10 will then combine with factor 5, platelet factor 3, and that will convert prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin is factor 2. Now, what happens is thrombin will then do what? He'll come over and activate another factor, which is actually going to be factor one. So you take this molecule called fibrinogen, which is basically the soluble protein produced by the liver, and you can convert that into an insoluble protein molecule called fibrin. And again, remember that this is factor one. Another thing that thrombin does is is he activates factor 13. And this activated factor 13 does what? It basically cross-links the fibrin strands. And so you get cross-linking of a fibrin mesh. And that basically gives you this nice stable clot that we need, right? Now, there's another process here where you guys remember if there's damage to the tissue uh, around the actual outside of the blood vessel where the blood is contained, that can release a specific type of molecule called tissue factor. And if you guys remember what happens with the tissue factor, so let's say that here's going to be the tissue here, right? It releases this from whenever it's damaged or injured, it releases what's called factor three. And they also call this tissue factor. Factor three will then activate another specific protein. And what is that protein called? I'll give you a hint. It's right here. Factor seven. Let's actually highlight him a little bit here. So what it does is it activates factor seven and converts this into the active form and seven is going to be a stimulator. It's also utilized to convert factor 10 from the inactive form into the active form. Isn't that important? That's very important. So here's what I want us to do. Let's look and see how this is involved. Factor two, where is it involved? If you inhibit this. If you inhibit factor two, you inhibit the formation of fibrin. If you also inhibit that, you inhibit the formation of factor 13, which cross links the fibrin mesh. Why is that important? Do you guys remember that whenever we have that fibrin mesh, what it does? It basically anchors down that actual, there's our fibrin, we're gonna cross-link it now to anchor down that actual platelet plug. On top of that, we have factor seven. Where's factor seven? That's a part of this little extrinsic pathway. Remember, whenever there's damage to the uh, layers outside of the blood vessel, it releases factor three, tissue factor. That gets into the blood, and then reacts with factor seven, turning it into the activated form, which then stimulates factor 10. And that continues down this process to make our fibrin mesh, right? Now, factor nine, it's also involved in the intrinsic pathway. Factor 10 is involved in the common pathway. So here's why, if you can tell from this, you inhibit these, you inhibit a significant process of clot formation. 
let's talk very briefly about this protein C and protein S, and more specifically, it's protein C that we worry about. Reason why is protein S, it's a cofactor for protein C. So really, the two are pretty much gonna be the same function in general. So how does that work? Go back to that hemostasis video if you guys are confused with any of this process. On the endothelial lining, you guys can remember, there's a specific protein called thrombomodulin. We talked about that in the beginning of the video. What things help to keep the blood naturally thin. We talked about nitric oxide, prostacyclin, heparin sulfate, and thrombomodulin. So what is this molecule here called? He's called thrombomodulin. Now what happens is thrombomodulin will bind on to another protein called thrombin. And what happens is whenever it's bound to thrombin, it causes thrombin to take this protein produced by the liver called protein C, which is actually bound to its, with its cofactor, protein S, and turn protein C into its activated form. We'll put CA there, okay? Now what protein C does is, is heat breaks down or inhibits two specific proteins that you guys gotta remember, son of a gun. And that is factor five and factor eight. It will inhibit these two forms of clotting proteins. Why are these important? What does factor five help with? It helps to be able to activate factor 10, which helps to convert prothrombin into thrombin, which basically helps to make fibrin. Fibrin makes the fibrin mesh, which helps to stab stabilize that secondary platelet plug. What about factor eight? Factor eight reacts with factor nine. Factor nine then helps to activate factor 10 to factor 10A, which then helps to activate thrombin, which then helps to form fibrin, and again, you get the stabilization of the secondary platelet plug. So basically, what happens with this, and this is where people can get a little bit confused. In the beginning of when someone is taking warfarin, protein C has a very short half-life. So because of that, the onset of whenever these, this, you're taking warfarin, the first thing to actually be the most affected from it is the protein C and protein S. So remember, what is it doing? It's decreasing the functionality whenever you're taking warfarin of protein C and protein S. So if you think about that, if I get a decrease in the, fun the production of functional or activated protein C, Am I gonna be able to inhibit factor five and factor eight? No. And so now these concentrations are going to go up. When they go up, what does that mean? Oh my gosh, if I have an increase in factor five, I increase factor 10, make more thrombin, make more fibrin, I'm going to enhance that platelet plug. Zach, how does that make sense? What about factor eight? Factor eight, oh, it's gonna react with more factor nine, activate factor 10, make more thrombin, make more fibrin, and then stabilize the clot. Zach, I thought you said the warfarin is an anticoagulant. It is, but whenever you first take warfarin, it has this ability to cause hypercoagulation within the first couple days of taking it. And that's one of the things that we have to understand why. It's because protein C is the first thing to get affected. Protein C and protein S are the first Clotting factors to be affected within the first few days of taking warfarin. What does that mean? That means that they're hypercoagulable because they produce a little bit extra activated factor five and activated factor eight, which helps to accelerate the clotting process. After a couple days though, the effect on protein C and protein S is overtaken by the factor two, seven, nine, 10. These guys, their concentration starts decreasing. If you decrease the concentration of factor two, you decrease thrombin, you decrease fibrin production, and you decrease this clot. If you decrease factor seven, you decrease the activation of 10, thrombin, and the fibrin. If you decrease factor nine, you decrease the activation, again, of thrombin and the fibrin mesh. And again, factor 10, you decrease the activation of thrombin. You get the point. Then eventually, you're gonna have this anticoagulant effect. So remember, whenever you first take warfarin, first couple days, you're hypercoagulable. Why? Because protein C is the first one to be affected. After a couple days goes on, protein C and protein S hypercoagulability will be overtaken 
by the decrease in functional protein uh, factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, which will cause the, ex the uh, a strong anticoagulant-like effect by inhibiting these specific proteins. All right. So the last thing that we need to understand when we're talking about warfarin, especially with the mechanism of action, because it goes hand in hand, is potential drug interactions. Whenever you're putting someone on warfarin, whether it be for AFib, whether it be for prophylaxis against like a, a DVT or PE or after they've had a surgery or they have heart failure, whatever it is, you wanna make sure that you're looking to see if the patient is on any other medication that could either increase the concentration of warfarin, make them bleed, or decrease the concentration of warfarin. Basically, they still clot. That is important. So how do, we, how do we do that? Look in their history and figure out, oh, is this medication gonna be a potential one? How do I remember all the medications? I got you guys. It's gonna be a good quick little mnemonic device that I like to remember, um, particularly as those that actually increase the effect of warfarin. So how do you remember that? So I remember O devices. And this isn't all of them, but this is the more common drugs that people are on that can actually particularly do what to this enzyme? Well, let's think about it. Warfarin is actually going to be broken down by the specific cute little Hay Arnold enzyme. What is this enzyme called? This enzyme is called the cytochrome P450 oxidase. And what happens is, Warfarin is actually broken down and metabolized by this enzyme. So you're gonna get the metabolite that can then be excreted, right? But we need to know if we inhibit this enzyme, we inhibit the breakdown of warfarin and increase the concentration of warfarin. So this is going to be the drugs that are going to be particularly inhibiting this enzyme. If you inhibit this enzyme, you have less breakdown of warfarin. What are some of these drugs? A meprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, right? So it's good for people with a GERD, maybe peptic ulcer disease. Disulfrium. This is actually a medication that you give to patients who are alcohol abusers and want to undergo the withdrawal process. Basically, they want to stop drinking. It's a prophylactic medication because if you drink alcohol and take this medication, it causes you to get really sick. You get nauseous, you, you, you vomit, you feel terrible. Uh, ethanol, particularly acute use of ethanol. So acute use of ethanol can also affect warfarin. Valproic acid or valproate. This is an anti-epileptic, you use it for migraines, you can use it for bipolar disease, a lot of different things. Isoniazid, which is also abbreviated as INH, it's an anti-tuberculosis medication. C, ciprofloxacin, which is a type of antibiotic. There's another medication called cimetidine. They use this a lot in antihistamine uh, medications. Another thing is erythromycin, not as commonly used by, as compared to its brother azithromycin, but it is a type of macrolide that can be used to treat a multitude of different types of bacterial infections. And the last thing is gonna be sulfa drugs. Again, these are going to increase warfarin, warfarin. Okay, because they inhibit this enzyme, which basically inhibits the breakdown of warfarin into its meta metabolite. The other one that I want you to remember is CP bars, yo. So CP bars. So CP bars is going to be the name of the drugs that are going to stimulate this enzyme. If you stimulate this enzyme, you increase the breakdown of warfarin into its metabolite, therefore decreasing the warfarin concentration. So you wanna remember CP bars. And again, these are some of the big ones. So one of them is called carbamazepine, okay? They use this in patients with trigeminal neuralgia. They can use it as an anti-epileptic. They can use this for patients who are also struggling with bipolar disease, right? Another one is called phenytoin. It's an anti-epileptic medication. Barbiturates. This is gonna be things like phenobarbital, okay? Another very powerful sedative anti-epileptic medications that can be used in like status epilepticus. Alcohol, particularly chronic alcohol use. 
So chronic alcohol use you got to watch out for. What else? Rifampin, which is another type of anti-tuberculosis medication, and St. John's wort. Okay. So these are important drugs that you want to watch out for. Also, think about it. What is involved in the warfarin process, the mechanism of action? Vitamin K. You got to be monitoring their vitamin K levels as well. In other words, you know, be, being careful. So we have to also monitor, so monitor their vitamin K intake or levels. And how do you do that? Again, go into their history. What if they have a disease that decreases their vitamin K absorption? In other words, they have like celiac disease, right? Where they don't absorb it a lot because there's damage to the small intestine through certain types of autoimmune mechanisms. Or what if they have pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, where they don't produce those pancreatic enzymes to break down those nutrients so that you can absorb them. You don't get vitamin K. What if they've been on antibiotics, very powerful antibiotics that destroy their bacteria flora. That, and you know our bacteria flora do two nice things for us. They give us complex vitamins like B vitamins and vitamin K. So if you decrease the vitamin K levels for whatever reason, what is gonna to happen to this process? Well, less vitamin K is actually going to be what? Think about it, vitamin K is needed. If less vitamin K is here, then that's less vitamin K epoxide reductase that is actually going to, there's gonna be more of this vitamin K epoxide reductase to inhibit the low vitamin K levels. So if you have low vitamin K, you're gonna have more inhibition of these procoagulants, and therefore you're going to bleed more likely. So you have to be careful. If someone has low vitamin K, they could have more increased risk of bleeding, okay? So watch out for that. All right, that covers our mechanism of action of this drug. Let's go into the indications. Yep. All right, guys, so let's talk about the indications of warfarin. It's very good at being able to inhi inhibit clot formation, so it's good for preventing thromboembolisms. So with that being said, what do we use it for? Well, as you can see here, we got a leg with a vein in it. It's a deep vein. And then we got our lungs, which are gonna be very nicely connected to that, right? So one of the good reasons, one of the big reasons that we use this is actually prophylactically. Uh, warfarin is, you take it per orally, and it actually takes a little bit for it to actually start to kick in. It takes a couple days. So it might take somewhere up, upwards of you know, two to three days before it actually starts experiencing the maximum effect because it has a half-life of about 40 hours. So it might take about two or three days before it really starts to kick in and become uh, you know, able to do its job. That's not good whenever you, someone, someone is having an acute pulmonary embolism. So that's not really the drug that we give whenever someone is having an acute PE or an acute DVT. We're more likely to use drugs like heparin, and we'll talk about that in another video. But if someone has basically had heparin to treat their acute DVT and PE, and they need prophylactic treatment for developing one in the future, then that would be a good job for warfarin, because that's gonna be more of a chronic prophylaxis management, right? So if someone has had a previous DVT, so it's good for prophylactic, so good for prophylaxis of DVT, and PE. Because we know that whenever someone develops clots with inside of this deep, uh, deep veins of the calf, what happens? It can travel up through the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it gets pumped out into the pulmonary circulation, and that embolus can then block blood flow to the lungs. And that can lead to very dangerous symptoms. Obviously, tachypnea, shortness of breath, maybe hemoptesis, maybe they have some chest pain, okay? From there, what do we do if someone we think someone's having a PE? You obviously gold standard, if, especially if they have a high degree of suspicion, is go to send them to get a, a CT angiogram, right? So they do a helical CT scan, look to see if there is any types of clots or filling defects within the pulmonary circulation, okay? But again, you're gonna treat them acutely with, wet, with uh, heparin and then long-term chronic prophylaxis if they need it, you're, you can give them warfarin prophylactically, okay? So that is another option. What's another thing that you gotta think about? What if someone has had some type of surgery? Not just that they recovered from a PE, but they had some type of severe surgery which caused them to be bedridden. All right, so remember, this is why it's so important. If someone's bedridden and they're not able to move around, what does that affect? Verco's triad, remember that from physiology? Verco's triad says that if someone has stasis, if someone is hyper, coagulable. 
if someone has endothelial dysfunction or injury, what does this do? This increases the risk of thrombosis, right? And that's Verco's triad. So if someone is recovering from a PE or DVT and you want long-term prophylaxis against them developing another one, you can give them warfarin. Or if you want prophylaxis of a DVT or PE after someone is recovering from a surgery that's causing them to be bedridden, such as uh, total hip replacement, total knee replacement, some type of hip fracture surgery, anything that's causing them to be bedridden, it's good to give them warfarin for those reasons, okay? That is something that you wanna know. All right, sweet deal. The other thing that you see warfarin using a, a, a lot in is because it's a very common condition is atrial fibrillation. Why is this important? Because AFib is an arrhythmia, right? We talked about this a little bit in the EKG series. It's an arrhythmia that develops re entrant circuits or multiple ectopic focus uh, uh, basically fire off at all different times and rates. And basically, the atria don't properly contract. Go back to Virco's triad. If the atria is basically not able to properly contract, it's like quivering, what happens to the amount of blood that's being pushed from the left atrium into the left ventricle? It's decreasing because the, the contraction, the power of contraction, pushing the blood from the atrium to the ventricle, it's decreased. So blood starts to kind of pool up and accumulate in the atria. It stagnates. What happens whenever there's stagnation of blood? Clots. And then because of that, you can develop these thrombi on the valves. Okay, there's multiple different reasons why patients can develop AFib. We're not gonna go into that. I just want you to know that if someone does have AFib, why are they more prone to clots? It's because the atria are trying to contract, right? Push blood into the ventricles. If they don't contract as well because they have multiple different sites trying to fire at the same time, because of that, it's not gonna properly develop enough force to push all the blood that it needs to from the atrium to the ventricles. And some of the blood is gonna sit inside of the atria. If blood doesn't move, what happens? You can lead to stasis, which leads to thrombosis. And they can develop on these valves. Why is that a problem? Let's say for whatever reason, you go through some acute stressful-like event, and because of that, that thrombi breaks off. Where can it go? Oh, it can go to a lot of places. If it goes, and breaks off here, it can go up into the coronary circuit, it can go into the coronary circulation and cause an MI. It can go into the aorta, go down and actually go up through the carotid system and affect the brain. What can that cause? Oh, that could lead to an ischemic stroke. Okay? And we don't want that. So that could lead to an ischemic stroke, right? A CVA. So we don't want that to happen. What else could happen? A clot could then go and travel not just into the actual uh, carotid circulation, into the coronary circulation, but it could also go into the intestines. And it could block the blood flow going to the intestines. What can this cause? This can cause something called, especially if it's the SMA, if it's the supramesenteric artery, it can cause mesenteric ischemia. And if it's affecting more of the IMA, then it can cause what's called ischemic colitis. Okay, and that's just because of their blood flow. So IMA is more likely to be ischemic colitis, and SMA is more likely to cause mesenteric ischemia. Other places, if you really wanna know, because I know you guys do, it, you also gotta be careful for the kidneys. Okay, so also watch out because it can affect the kidneys, and it can cause renal insufficiency. Okay, so watch out for the kidneys. And another one that you gotta watch out for is the spleen. Those are common areas where these infarcts can actually, these thromboemboli can form. So big ones that you wanna watch out for. Watch out for the blood supply that's going to the myocardium itself. So imagine here, this is gonna be the coronary artery here, right? You gotta watch out for thrombi going to the coronary arteries, okay? This is an emboli that can break off from that valve, travel into the coronary circulation, cause an MI. The blood can actually go into the kidney, right? You can actually form an, uh, an embolus that forms within the, one of the renal vessels, into the carotid circulation, into the mesenteric circulation, even going to the splenic artery to the spleen, okay? These are things that you gotta be careful of. So if someone has AFib, whether it be valvular or non-valvular, atrial fibrillation, 
That's one reason that we should give them warfarin. What's another one? What's another thing that could actually cause uh, blood to stagnate in the ventricles? What if someone had a significant myocardial infarction? So they had a significant myocardial infarction and all of this area of tissue is replaced by fibrous tissue. Can fibrous tissue contract? No. If fibrous tissue can't contract, what's gonna happen to the area of blood that can pool up in this little area right here? It can form a thrombi. So you can actually get a left ventricular thrombus as a potential complication of someone having a very significant MI. So we have to watch out for that as well. So if someone had a recent myocardial infarction, they can get a left ventricular thrombus. Also, what if the ventricles aren't pumping enough? What if their strength, they're not pumping enough blood out and a lot of blood is staying within the ventricles? What could that be due to? CHF. So anything that can basically cause a stagnation of blood within the atria or the ventricles could be potential reasons of someone developing a thromboembolism and, and getting transferred to the brain, to the myocardium, to the intestines, to the kidneys, maybe even the spleen, okay? So watch out for AFib, watch out for post-MI, which can basically lead to a left ventricular thrombus, and also watch out for CHF, okay? Because they develop a decrease in the contractility. And if they have a decrease in the contractility, you guys will also remember that they're going to have a decrease in the amount of blood that's actually being ejected out, right? So they have a decrease in their stroke volume. But because they also have a lot of blood remaining in there, uh, the amount of blood that remains in after ventricular contraction, right, your ESV, that's actually going to increase. So they're gonna have a lot of blood sitting in the ventricles afterwards. And again, that promotes a lot of stasis and therefore clots. That is what you gotta be careful of with these. Okay, so warfarin is designed to be able to inhibit that. Now, Last thing we gotta talk about with the indications here is how, this little bit about this PT-INR thing. How do we do this? I just wanna briefly go over it. Remember I told you that PT-INR is a way that we monitor the extrinsic pathway, okay? So, how does this work? You take a test tube. Okay, here's gonna be a test tube. And what we do is we draw some blood from the patient. When we draw the blood from the patient, we're going to separate it and we're only going to take the patient's plasma. That's all we want right now. We just want their plasma. So we're gonna take and separate it out and get just the patient's plasma, okay? So we'll centrifuge it, we'll take some of the stuff off the, we'll take that plasma off the top of the test tube, transfer it into another container. Then what we'll do is we'll send it to a lab. Different labs have different types of kits. And all of those different kits have different control times. In other words, if you take a population in Wisconsin, you take a population in Pennsylvania, you take a population in Connecticut, wherever, there's different PTs, okay, control PTs based upon the kit that you use. So what they do is, in the lab, they'll take the person's plasma and they'll give them what's called tissue factor. You guys remember that? Tissue factor, factor three? They'll add that in. And then once they add that in, they're gonna me measure the time it takes for this to undergo clot formation. So they'll add that in, and they'll look to see when does it actually form a clot. So we're just gonna show it a different color here. It's gonna be all clotted up now, okay? This right here, this time is called the PT. But we need, the problem is, is that PTs, we need some type of like standard, to, like a standard ratio that we can compare it to. Okay, so now let's take, for example, the time that it takes for this blood to clot. Let's say this is my blood, right? And so we say, okay, let's say Zach's PT, right? And that is, what does PT stand for? Let's just actually write that over here. This is prothrombin time. That's what it stands for, right? So we're gonna take my PT, and let's say that it's 23 seconds, okay? So that's gonna be the time it takes for my blood to clot, okay? Then we're gonna say, let's take a kit. We're gonna just call this kit A, okay? And kit A, every kit, no matter what lab, has a control PT. And let's say that that control PT happens to be, I don't know, 11 seconds. 
What we need to do is get a ratio between my PT and that lab's PT. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna divide these two. So now, if we take this into consideration, I wanna know what's the ratio between these. So that's called my INR, my International Normalized Ratio. So 23 divided by 11, it's gonna be around, um, it's gonna be around like two, okay? So it's like 2.09. You know, All right, so because of that, that gives me a decent sized number. Now, normal PTs for patients who are not on warfarin is usually like less than or equal to about one. So we can say normal PT. So if we're saying a normal PT, is usually somewhere around less than or equal to one, okay? When someone is on warfarin, we don't want that. We want it to be a little bit higher, okay? So we want it to actually be between two and three, okay? So what we want for a person who is taking warfarin, we ideally want their INR, so while on warfarin, we want the patient's INR to be a little bit higher than one. We want it to be somewhere between two to three. Okay, that's kind of right around that sweet spot. There is another time where if someone has a heart valve, because heart valves can be thrombogenic, like a prosthetic heart valve, you do want it to be just a little bit higher. You can go maybe up to four max. Some books will even say 3.5. So if, if they do have a prosthetic heart valve, you might want it to be a little bit higher because prosthetic heart valves are highly thrombogenic depending upon what type you get. But either way, that's what I want you guys to understand about this. So it's super simple. You give too much warfarin, what's gonna happen? If you give too much warfarin, you're going to inhibit the extrinsic pathway very, very strongly, right? And again, we're talking mainly about factor seven as the most effect on that. You inhibit factor seven, you don't clot. So the time it takes before this blood to clot is going to increase. That means that this number will climb and climb and climb. So let's say I take too much warfarin. That might climb to like 38 seconds. 38 seconds divided by 11 seconds, oh my gosh, that INR is gonna go really, really high. So a high INR means that you're giving too much warfarin. It's a simple concept, all right? So high INR means too much warfarin. What if I have not enough warfarin? That means that that factor seven can still form clots and it might be a little bit quicker than usual. So now my PT is going to decrease. Maybe it goes down to 11 seconds. What is my INR now? 11 divided by 11 is one. So now my PT drops. So what I want you to remember, low INR means you're more likely to form clots. In, the, in this case, the warfarin particularly considering this is what the therapeutic range we wanted in. If you go above that, higher than three, again, you're high at risk of bleeding, okay? So that's why we have to take into consideration their dosage, as well as what medications and foods they're consuming, okay? So that covers the indications and also about the PTINR monitoring. Okay, so last thing that I want us to talk about here is their adverse drug reactions and contraindications. It really is simple that when you, when you think about it, when someone's taking warfarin, it's an anticoagulant, so if it's a blood thinner, right? So they're more at risk of bleeding, especially if you take too much of the warfarin or you have another drug that you're taking that can increase the concentration of it, like we talked about, O devices, right? Or you have um, very little of that vitamin K, right? Again, these are things to take into consideration. So what are the risks? Bleeding. What kind of bleeding? It's really simple. You just gotta look at some of the things like, uh, for example, they could have some gingival bleeding, Right? They could have some anterior epistaxis. Look at our little French dude that we got here. He could be bleeding, right? So epistaxis. All right, what about blood coming from another orifice? What if it's coming from the actual rectum, right? So you have blood coming out from the rectum. This could be things like melena, especially if it's dark blood, right? That means that it's an upper GI bleed more likely. Or it could be hematochesia, right? So it could be some bright red blood or they could be vomiting up blood, right? So there could be some hematemesis. And depending upon the color of that, that could also be important to take into consideration. You also have to think about other things. What if it's just like, you know, from the skin, you get petechia, you get papura, you get acamosis, all of those easy bleeding signs. Maybe you have blood in the urine. Maybe that's not even the thing. Maybe you don't even find the bleed and the patient is actually fairly fatigued, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, and you do a hemocult. Right? So you take and you do a digital rectal exam, you do the hemocult test and it comes up positive. 
These are all things that you have to think about whenever you're putting someone on warfarin. It's also really important before you put them on warfarin, make sure that you check their CBC. Check that CBC, check their actual coags beforehand before putting it on it. And then monitor it as well. One of the really weird things with, um, with warfarin is it can cause, remember I told you that within the first couple days of taking warfarin, it actually decreases protein C and protein S, which can cause hypercoagulability. Remember I told you that? So we said that whenever you take warfarin, right? So warfarin, we're gonna say um, within the first, let's say two to three days of taking it, it significantly inhibits protein C and protein S. Why is that important? Protein C and protein S, what do they normally do? They are normally designed to be able to inhibit factor five and factor eight. And what do these naturally want to do? They want to stimulate thrombus formation. Okay? So, if you give warfarin two to three days first hint, it inhibits protein C and protein S pretty strongly in the first couple days because these have very short half-lives and they're first affected. So now their concentration significantly decreases. If the protein C and protein S concentration significantly decreases, what happens to the ability to inhibit factor five and factor 8A? That decreases. So now, instead of actually inhibiting them, you're going to actually allow for them to have a loss of inhibition. So now there's a stimulation to the production of, uh, to the activation of factor five and factor eight. And that increases thrombus formation. Because of that, think about that. If you form a thrombus within the vessels, small vessels around the, of, of the skin, what happens to the blood flow going to this area? That's gonna have a decreased blood flow, decreased blood flow, decreased blood flow. What do you get as a result of that? That ischemia leads to necrosis and the tissue starts to die. And then you start getting this actual necrotic tissue. So again, what's gonna happen, you're gonna get a decreased blood flow because of these thrombi, and you're gonna start seeing necrotic tissue formation. What areas do we worry about this necrosis occurring in? We worry about areas such as, um, this is called, well specifically, we worry about like the limbs, that's one area, the breasts, the penis. Okay, these are areas that are commonly affected whenever someone is taking warfarin and it can cause necrosis of that tissue area. What do we call this? We call this, let's give a different color, let's call this warfarin induced skin necrosis. Warfarin induced skin necrosis. This is something that you have to watch out for when you're putting someone on warfarin. Okay? Now, how do we prevent this? It's actually a very simple thing to prevent this. Because you're hypercoagulable within the first couple days of taking it, guess what you do? You put someone on heparin. So you give them heparin, and what heparin is going to do is, Heparin is actually going to work by inhibiting thrombin and factor 10. So what it does is inhibits factor 10 and it also inhibits factor um, two. So factor two, which is actually going to be thrombin, we'll just put that here, it inhibits these guys. And basically by inhibiting that, you inhibit thrombus formation, right? So you give heparin in the first couple days of taking warfarin, because that will inhibit factor 10 and factor two, which will inhibit thrombus formation. So we call this bridging therapy. So whenever someone is gonna be taking warfarin with the first couple days, you give them warfarin and you give them heparin, because heparin is going to basically counteract this thrombotic effect. After that uh, warfarin starts to kick in, then that anth the procoagulant properties, those are gonna be inhibited, and again, you're gonna lose this hypercoagulability. So again, Always bridge with heparin for the first couple days of starting warfarin. Another thing you have to remember is if someone is really bleeding, like you give them too much warfarin for whatever reason, uh, or again, there's a, some type of drug that they're taking and it's increasing the concentration of warfarin really, really crazy, what's their risk for? Their risk for bleeding. What's the first thing you do? Patient comes into the emergency department, they're bleeding, they have a history of AFib, their records show that they're taking warfarin, you get blood work. 
okay? When you get the blood work, you find that their PT is super elevated. You find out that their INR is super elevated. What are you worried about? They may have too much warfarin and they're bleeding. You need to give them an antidote, something that's gonna prevent this from continuously developing this, this bleeding process. So what do you treat them with? When a patient has too much warfarin, you need to remember the antidote for this situation. First thing you do is you start them on a slow infusion of vitamin K. Okay, so you give a slow infusion of vitamin K, usually like five to 10 milligrams. You start them on the slow infusion of vitamin K. It takes a couple hours before it really kicks in. The next thing you do is you give them a combination of something else. So there's two options. Research has shown that between these two, one is a little bit more superior. They say that the prothrombin complex concentrate is more superior than the fresh frozen plasma, okay? But the main thing is that you give them one of these two agents. All this PCC is, is it's just a complex of factor two, factor seven, factor nine, five, factor 10, okay? Factor nine and factor 10. And they throw in some other stuff in there like protein C, protein S, antithrombin three, to have some of that kind of counteractive effect. Fresh frozen plasma, is all the clotting proteins, all clotting proteins, okay? This is just a little bit quicker. The PCC is a little bit quicker into the system. It's gonna provide a little bit more effect. It is a little bit more expensive though, but it's more superior to the fresh frozen plasma when someone is having an acute bleed due to excessive high amounts of warfarin levels that they're taking too much for whatever reason. First thing you need to remember, if they are, give them vitamin K and give them PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, or fresh frozen plasma. It really depends on preference. They say that the PCC is a little bit more superior. And what's that gonna do? Think about it. You're giving these, these uh, procoagulants, what's it gonna do? It's gonna basically help to allow for some clotting, right? So you're gonna allow for some clotting. Fresh frozen plasma, again, you're giving all the clotting proteins. If you give vitamin K, what is that gonna do? That's gonna oversaturate the vitamin K epoxide reductase. If you oversaturate it, what's it gonna happen then? You're still not gonna be able, you're not gonna be able to inhibit the production of those procoagulants. And so those procoagulants will still rise. So this is important to remember whenever someone is bleeding a lot, give them vitamin K, MPCC, or fresh frozen plasma. All right guys, so last thing that we need to know before, um, before ending this video with uh, uh, warfarin is what are some contraindications, things that you gotta watch out for. It's really simple. Understanding a lot of the stuff that we talked about already, it should really make sense. What structure inside of the body makes clotting proteins? The liver, right? So if someone has, let's say, liver failure, okay, their ability to produce clotting proteins, so clotting proteins, what's gonna happen? There's gonna be a decrease in the production of clotting proteins. So if you give them warfarin, what could happen? Well, they don't make very much clotting proteins as it is. You give them warfarin, you're gonna significantly decrease the number of coagulating proteins. So what can happen? They can seriously bleed. So that's something that you have to think about. If you have decreased clotting proteins, what's warfarin gonna do? Warfarin is basically trying to inhibit the production of clotting proteins. So now you're gonna have less clotting proteins within the blood. That's gonna make it extremely thin within the blood, again, anticoagulant-like effect, and they're at higher risk of bleeding. Simple thing, okay? So liver failure, you can give it if you wanna to try to, but you really need to be so careful in these patients because again, they're at high risk of bleeding. All right, next thing, Pregnancy, you do not give warfarin to pregnant women. It's teratogenic. It can produce a lot of different congenital defects. What are some of the congenital defects to mention? The main thing that you wanna remember is it can affect the little baby's heart, right? So it can cause congenital heart defects. So it can cause congenital heart defects. If you really wanna remember, one is called patent ductus arteriosus, and the other one is called coarctation of the aorta. And that's really sad, you know? So these, these are conditions that are, you know, definitely a, can affect the quality of life, right? Another thing that's even more severe than that is it can cause um, central nervous system malformations, okay? So it can cause uh, changes to what's called, you, know, you guys know this, the corpus callosum. 
It's the structure that allows communication between the right and left hemisphere. That can actually decrease in size. Okay, they can have a smaller head. They can have fluid that builds up with inside of the actual uh, subarachnoid space. So this can cause a lot of central nervous system uh, d uh, d d uh, dysfunction. Okay, and last thing is it can also affect the facial structures. So another thing is it can actually affect uh, like the nose. It can affect the. Um, uh, specifically the airway and what happens is it makes the nose really really tiny and it makes the nasal cavity in the back of the nasal cavity super super tiny it's called coanal atresia it causes thickening of the larynx it causes laryngomalacia they get a cleft palate all of these things basically alter the actual flow of air and this can lead to respiratory distress okay so these are things that you want to be careful of. Again, contraindicated in pregnancy because it can cause central nervous system dysfunction leading to mental retardation, respiratory distress through structures, changes within the face, and congenital heart defects that can definitely alter the quality of life within a child. Last thing, it really is simple, bleeding risks. If someone is actively bleeding, are you gonna to wanna to give them some type of medication like warfarin? If they have uncontrollable hypertension, which can lead to an aortic dissection, Right, so things like, what could they be at risk for? Bleeding risk. Again, simple, if they're actively bleeding. If they have risks that can cause very dangerous things. If they have high blood pressure, uncontrollable high blood pressure. The reason why is that could lead to an aortic dissection. What if they have an aortic aneurysm, okay? So they have an aortic aneurysm and then again, you give them an anticoagulant, somehow it ruptures because it's greater than 5.5 centimeters, again, they're gonna bleed. There's a lot of different things that we have to be careful of, but you just gotta be, uh, again, attentive to the fact of, are they having anything that could increase the risk of them bleeding? What are those things? And does, does the, you know, the risk outweigh the benefit? In this situation, it's better to err on the side of caution and watch out for this stuff and maybe find another medication instead, okay? So that gives us everything we need to know about warfarin. And we should know that. That is really important. Oh my gosh.